Thank you for being here, Professor Inchikiti. It's amazing to see how indeed, you know, bringing cultures together, you know, US, Italy, and, you know, my also contribution from Central America and Honduras really can make a powerful um, opportunity to not only share our stories, but also like, you know, you mentioned, you know, to really raise awareness and um, empower some of the young generations. And certainly a thank <laughs> to Michelle for inviting me, for putting together this very interesting initiative of many ways how we can all um, not only study, but um, uh, try to achieve finding better ways um, to get to what we really uh, strive for, which is um, equity and how uh, we have to really adapt to many, uh, many changes um, uh, around the world. So I hope that you like a little bit um, the story that I have to give you. I had the opportunity of meeting with a few of the students already having lunch. So hopefully it's not a, too much repetitive for you. Um, I need to just you know, disclose my uh, uh, conflicts of interest. So I am a co-inventor and patent holder for several vaccine technologies um, for neglected diseases, and specifically for the COVID-19 vaccine, we um, did not opt it, uh, to patent it or to protect its uh, intellectual property, but um, the college, uh, of course, owns the information, and we have managed to share some of our um, experiences as well as um, reagents through non-license, uh, non-exclusive licenses, and then I'll tell you a little bit about that. Let's start the fun part. <clears throat> so again, my uh, culture, my roots really come from combining um, Italy and Honduras, <coughs> having been born in Genova uh, from a family of Italian descent. My dad, you know, of Italian descent. My mom, Italian, from different fields, you know, economy, um, business. Uh, but ultimately ended up growing up in Honduras. And my story really starts academically, right, you know, of what was I interested when I was studying in school. Um, but when I reached the point of uh, picking a career um, pathway um, in the university, I studied at the National University and I met Dr. Umberto Cosenza, who at the time he was the chair of the Department of Microbiology and ended up studying under him and many professors' guidance the, um, the field of microbiology and clinical chemistry. But as, as I was telling the students earlier, microbiology is it's a very broad discipline, right? You know, of course, as the word says, you, you study the microbes, and there's many, 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 many. Um, but you also study how they interact with the different hosts, which also we are many not only human hosts, but veterinary animals, even environment and plants. You know, plants do have parasites and do have microbes. Um, or even, you know, the air or how they actually are um, transmitted through other vectors or even, you know, who are um, the animal reservoirs, you know, for many of these parasites. And after you study the microbes and after you study how they interact with your host, the key of a microbiologist is to try to help finding the solutions, the solutions to better detect those microbes, the solutions of what to do when the microbe is already in the host um, by treating the microbes, or of course also preventing that we get and encounter these microbes, especially those that cause disease. So as I was studying after I finished in the University of Honduras, where I did you know, a, a, a few field and applied research work, I uh, decided to pursue a graduate degree. I, I went to the University of Florida. I worked under the uh, mentorship of Maureen Goodenow. And just as an FYI, Maureen now is um, the, uh, um, works at the Office of AIDS Research at the NIH. She's the director. So as you can see, it you know, kind of you know, morphed also you know, in, in, in how you start as an academic and you, know, you professionally can evolve to have you know, very different roles in the area of you know, the field. Then I moved to the University of Miami and later at Pennsylvania, where I was working with Dr. Rika Soyan, all in this area of molecular immunology, pathology, and even cellular biology. But as you can see already from the right side of the screen, 
that you know, while I was in Philly, I also decided that I needed to broaden a little bit my scientific knowledge. And I decided I would um, try to learn a little bit more about business um, by organizational behavior, by strategic management. And I ended up um, doing a program at the um, Fox School of Business at Temple where I came to the realization that a lot of the professors that were giving me the classes at Fox, they really came from the pharmaceutical sector. Um, so that opened up, you know, like my first kind of like little aha moment where I basically said, mm, this is actually sounds pretty interesting, how you can do science, how you can, you know, look for discoveries, but how can you then turn them into a business proposition into something that will really end up being deployed and eventually reach the people that you want to either you know, uh, prevent a disease or treat or even diagnose diseases. And all of this then led for me to um, meet and join Dr. Peter Hotis. Maybe many of you know um, uh, of him. Uh, and we met each other right in the year 1999 and uh, 2000 where he was actually just joining the George Washington University in Washington, D.C. And of course, we were there 11 years. Now we have, believe it or not, 12 years that we've been down here in Houston. But there were a few things that happened exactly at that turn of the century, that you know, year 2000. And it was what I call the, um, uh, the momentum of the Millennium Development Goals. So right in the year 2000, that the United Nations really noticed that uh, we had a lot of challenges globally. Not necessarily all just in health, but the majority had some uh, area of uh, involvement of health. You know, if you wanna increase education, you wanna make sure that the kids that need to go to school are healthy, right, so that they can get educated. Um, you want to reduce hunger. You want to, of course, give food security, but that also enables good health and certainly good education. Um, improving maternal health is certainly important. Improving child health and reduce child mortality is also very important. MDG number six was very interesting and very uh, important for us because it really called upon trying to tackle infectious diseases. And of course, some of them were really named by name, right? HIV, malaria, you know, tuberculosis. That really rallied a lot of um, political will. Um, even uh, champions that were, you know, rallied around combating these diseases from the Bonos trying to combat, you know, combat or help, you know, with HIV, malaria to Angelina Jolie to President Bush, to, to you know, the, uh, the Clinton. I mean, so there, a lot of these programs were really created trying to tackle, um, you know, these diseases, including, for example, the Global Fund, which really called for TB, malaria, and HIV um, uh, control. Um, MDG, of course, number seven, already alerted us that climate um, and environment uh, was essential to bring into the mix. It's been a, quite a struggle. I think that, as you know now, maybe slowly it's, it's really gaining a lot more momentum, but it's been, as you now know, 20 plus years that we've been trying to bring the um, role of climate into the, um, certainly the equation. And the last, which is MDG number eight, really is an MDG that really called on how would you be able to do MDG one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and the key is that the way that we could approach this is by working collectively and by doing things in partnership. And I give you a, an example, a couple of examples, that you know, the, it was heard, right? So for you know, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, who happened also to be created around at the same time, like you know, 1999-ish, um, they were very clear that you know, the work that they would try to support and fund would have to be done with this concept of public or private or um, or public public or uh, product development, but at the end of the day, partnerships. And not only them, but then big agencies, like for example, the uh, Global Alliance for Vaccine Initiative was created with the hope that they would help 
not only bring together all the vaccine manufacturers, um, show that they could be creating a business model of affordability, working with the country so that they could be able to purchase at you know, affordable prices the vaccines that they could use in their countries, but then incentivize them to sustain you know, the ability of deploying the vaccine. And on the right, right side, um, you see that scientifically, I think we as scientists, and certainly academia, already started hearing and seeing a movement of what we, of course, now very much you know, cherish is the open science movement. And it's an open science, of course, not only of sharing data and sharing reagents and, of course, sharing education, um, making things open access. I mean, we've seen throughout these last two decades how even journals went from journals that have the option of an open access or even 100% open access journals. Um, I put you know, an example that you know, right around 2014-ish, when we were trying to brand the neglected tropical diseases as part of these infectious diseases, we even, uh, together with Peter, uh, he was the founding editor-in-chief for the Public Library of Science Neglected Tropical Disease Journal. And now we even have the preprint servers. So as you can see, a lot of effort. By no means they're perfect. You know, they bring you know, challenges of you know, what is peer-reviewed, what is not peer-reviewed. But you know, for the most part, you know, uh, we follow that MDG momentum. So when we saw ourselves of making a decision, again, we were you know, Peter was just uh, recruited to GW. We were starting to create, you know, um, a department in microbiology. We said, what should be our focus of, um, of research and our focus within our department? And we noticed, again, many people working malaria, many people working TB, many people working HIV. But there were always these forgotten diseases, the diseases that are clearly have some mortality, but for the most part are huge morbidity diseases, meaning that they don't kill. You get infected with them when you're very early in childhood, but as you grow, you either can never get rid of them, and they really cause enormous amounts of uh, disability and morbidity. They're also very much cofactors of other diseases, so you know, there's some of these parasites exacerbate, you know, for example, you know, HIV uh, transmission, like is, uh, um, schistosomiasis. Or you have Chagas disease that you know, is a cardiomyopathy disease. So if you already have factors for cardiomyopathy, of course, having Chagas disease can exacerbate it. Uh, or hookworm, which of course is a, a, a worm that feeds on blood, and therefore you know, anything that um, has a link with malnourishment or a link with you know, iron deficiency, anemia, of course, you know, there's, you know, there's a potential of incrementing the burden. And we started you know, uh, working on them and making the case uh, of not only uh, put them together in this concept of neglected diseases, uh, assigning their burden, uh, working with the global burden of disease you know, with the Institute of Health Metrics and Evaluation to actually put a, a number, right? How can you quantify something that doesn't kill you, how, uh, you know, that it's stigmatic, that you know, maybe the, the, the symptoms are not you know, necessarily only clinical or physical symptoms. And so they came up with you know, a very probably convoluted you know, algorithm and, and, and model where each disease you can really quantify how many years you lose by living in some state of disability and then of course depends on what are those disabilities, right? And how you give them scores. And ultimately we see that these types of diseases can cause 30 million disability adjusted life years, which you know, are pretty prominent. At the same time, we knew that they were, of course, not only causing poverty, but they are promoting poverty because you just cannot get out of that cycle. And even if we go even further, working with health economies, we now even can quantify if you're disabled, if you're not educated, if you live in a constant state of disability, you're not economically productive in society. So how much do you um, uh, burden economically society by increase of healthcare costs or um, the fact that you cannot work and therefore you, know, you basically you know, have um, 
uh, productivity losses. And we can quantify those also being pretty prominent, at least $8 billion in productivity losses. So that's how we eventually then came about. And even though I'll show you what we are now here, it all was born in um, the DC area. But we decided first and foremost that we wanted to stay anchored in, a, in an academic setting. It would be even more beneficial if the academic setting would be partnered with a health center, meaning a system, a, a, health, a hospital system. Um, and that we would try to do our partnership model as a hybrid infrastructure, meaning not purely virtual and not all the capabilities amongst our groups, but that we would share some capabilities we would have, but other partners would have other capabilities. Some of them would be hybrid, you know, virtual or, you know, brick and mortar. And that's how we created, therefore, that you know, we have a, a very specific niche of what we do in our own labs, but then we partner with many labs around the world to complement this um, capa capability. We also decided that we were going to not do a single disease. We wanted to be cross-cutting and, therefore, focus on multi-diseases um, and also even go beyond the neglected diseases, but start working a little bit on emerging diseases. Again, we would do partnerships. And however, that even though we were looking at multi-diseases, we decided we were primarily going to focus on vaccines because we are firm believers of prevention. With vaccines, you always have to go line in line with diagnostics, right? You have to diagnose to make sure your preventive measure you know, worked. Um, of course, sometimes you have to link to um, chemotherapy interventions. You cure the person, and then you try to give them some uh, uh, vaccine that would prevent the reinfection or uh, an immune therapy. And that we were going to select the way we were going to design our, de our technologies, ideally with conventional platforms, something that, uh, even though it may be innovative, that it came to a point where it's a tipping point that they are not too strongly intellectual property protected that it wouldn't give us flexibility of working with them uh, globally. And that's where uh, it was very clear then for us that for us to be able to work in the vaccine sciences and trying to address many of these diseases, even though we were housed in the United States, that the design of our programs, even with this philosophy of, of you know, high burden diseases, had to rely on what we call um, inverse innovation, right? You know, that we had to first really understand what was needed, that we would bring those groups around the table so that they would guide the need and they would guide the design and they would guide the way that we would then, in our labs, help create the infrastructure that would be needed to create a technology. And with all that, we were also going to be able to uh, focus on, of course, achieving the health outcomes that we wanted to do, of course, safety, but also in a cost-effective manner, that we would therefore need to include the communities, right? It's not even enough, even with scientists, let's say, from Honduras, you needed to know scientists from Honduras, scientists from the U.S., but with the community around it, right? And that we wanted to give them ownership, and that's another reason why we didn't really want to protect, that we would leave the open science so that they could also claim it as a country or you know, um, uh, technology uh, ownership. And at the same time, I think as academics, you know, we then you know, built you know, um, training programs. We would uh, strengthen their capacity. We would build local self-resilience uh, and reliance. And of course, then you know, have these programs be sustainable, even if we were not to continue working uh, in the group. So I'm going to walk you through a, a, a series of steps. Um, I tried to make them as simple as possible, but again, using a little bit my business uh, mentality, right? Everything has has a process, right? Doesn't mean that the process is th straight line. Uh, I'm going to show you a series of steps, but I can assure you we did not start with step one. We probably started with like step three or four, and then we realized that we had to actually go back to step one. But you know, as you know, everything is always. You know, roads are very convoluted. Maybe we started in one way and then we realized that road was not feasible and we had to change. Sometimes we had to climb mountains. Sometimes we had to kind of like slide, you know, 
uh, through oceans to achieve what we wanted to do. But if you can, the ideal thing to do at the beginning is really understand what scientific strategy that you want to achieve or use. And in fact, that now uh, it's, um, there is a, you know, there are blueprints of how to do this, especially when you want to do translational research. And in fact, there was a paper published um, in Nature uh, Translational Medicine, I believe in 2008, that actually pretty much gave us that guide, right? And, and a guide that really tells us how do you go from the bench to the clinic? And, and likely even beyond the clinic, right? You know, how do you then deploy, you know, to the communities? And it's really, you know, a, a, a toolbox of a, a series of, you know, steps and checklists, you know, and where you ask yourself a lot of questions, right? So, for example, I want to develop a hook corn vaccine because I know it's, you know, it has a huge public health need. But what is that public health need, right? How do you quantify, you know, 800 million people infected, uh, iron deficiency anemia, exacerbate malaria, right? You know, you can create that case. Um, so is it significant? And is it significant for whom? Maybe it's not significant for us here, but it's clearly significant where they have hookworm, right? Um, how would you even do the model, right? You know, which would be the partners? Um, do we even understand the pathogen, you know, the cycle of the parasite? What would you even target, right? If you want to prevent, what do you, what's the hit that you want to do, right? Do you, we, for example, decided that for hookworm, they are blood feeders. Maybe we should mess with their blood feeding pathways. If they stop eating blood, they starve to death, and therefore the parasite sort of dies. And so, in fact, that's how we did it, right? So you have to really think a little bit also on how you want to target you know, the, the parasite how you're going to establish a mechanism, right? As you know, when you do vaccines, we, our body responds to the vaccines with our immune response. But our immune response is very complicated, right? Do you want an antibody response? Do you want a cellular response? What else do you need around? When do you give the vaccine, right? You know, all those kinds of things. So as you can see, you, you create this strategy, these business plans, to be very honest, but scientifically, um, there are key, um, documents that you also can prepare that eventually will help you with the regulations, right? You know, like a, you know, the, the intended population, what will you accept as an adverse event? Uh, you know, do you give it as an injection or do you give it as an oral indication, right? You know, uh, how do you want to store this vaccine? Do you want to store it in the refrigerator? You know, so all those little things you kind of like create as a guide. So that was like step one. Then we said, okay, fine, we kind of have a blueprint you know, of all the different things we want to do. We create blueprints for all our different diseases. And then we say, okay, but we really want to do this in academia, right? What, so how can we really leverage and how can we see that academia actually um, can help in this whole continuum of development? And this, especially this bench to clinic you know, um, aspect and beyond. And we rapidly realized that you know, academic institutions actually now do a lot. In fact, biopharmaceuticals, in fact, outsource a lot of the stuff back to academia because guess what? We're the creative ones. We're like really the intelligent ones. We are the um, flexible ones, right? We have you know, um, freedom, right? You know, you know pharmaceuticals sometimes is very protective, right? They cannot really do unless their stakeholders tell them what to do. So we realize that you know, academia really can go throughout the entire ecosystem, right? From very basic research to very, even community health services research. And so we knew that we could try to see if we could use all of them and then see where what we have the missing gaps, right? So we, we know that was a kind of like step two. And that's why we love being down here in the Med Center, right? Because not only what Baylor can do is, you know, what UH can bring, what Rice can bring, what, you know, Texas A&M can bring, what all the hospitals can bring, right? You know, in all these arenas. But the first lesson we got was even if we want to do the, you know, strategy and put together, you know, a plan, and even if we want to work in the academic system, nobody, I honestly tell you, at least not, you know, uh, in the last 10, 15 years, nobody really paid attention to the regulatory science, which really is what enables something to become something. Everything eventually has to go through a regulator, 
whether it's US regulation, whether it's Brazilian regulation, whether it's World Health regulation. So regulatory science is important. It's because when you then go to the pharmacy and buy a medicine or you get, go get a vaccine, you don't think that, you know, it was this done with good quality? Is this material safe? You know, how do they know about the adverse events, right? So regulatory science is very important. But we needed to change the culture of how we do regulatory science because regulatory science requires a lot of documentation, a lot of documentation. So if you are going to make a, you know, a mixture of reagents because you're going to run some experiment, you have to know exactly where you bought those reagents, what lot of reagents you used, who sold them to you, do they have animal-derived materials, um, uh, how stable are they? Are they not expired? You know, I said I was going to mix one milliliter of this with one milliliter of that. Did I mix one and one, or did I mix 0.9 and 1.2? So all of that has to be documented. That's considered the traceability of everything that we do. So our scientists needed to not scribble anymore in a little piece of paper and then stuck in their, you know, and then decide that they're going to change their experiment. We have very strict standard operating procedures. People also saying, did you put one milliliter? Let me see. Yes, check. You did one milliliter. So a lot of the regulatory science is something that it's um, very important, but it's very much learned, right? And if you really even see the competencies, they're not much different of what they already are teaching us in academia. You just not need to make sure that it's organized and that it's documented and that it has that mindset, right, that it will lead, that when somebody in the regulatory offices will read it, you know, it meets their requirements. But then guess what? Who sits in the regulatory offices? People who were scientists most likely before, right? Or people who came from academia before. So, so if you don't already teach them from the beginning so that they can then, when they arrive into their jobs, I mean, of course, they cannot do their jobs well. And strengthening those um, are very important, including the ethics, including the communication, including, of course, you know, all the different um, dissemination. So then, okay, so we kind of, you know, understood a little bit, you know, academia, but then we said, but then there must be something that big multinationals do um, that are clearly the preferred model of biopharmaceutical development. And why these inventions and why this academic know-how sometimes is kind of sucked out of us, enters into some black hole. We don't really know what happens in there. But eventually, you have this gangbuster drug that comes out of it, right? Uh, and that then you have to either pay for it or that you, know, you, you don't really understand. And we really realize that they operate as much as you know, <laughs> it has to be. They operate as a business, right? They really have very key business practices that they really talk about. You know, not only they talk to a different audience, right? They talk to their stakeholders, but they have they talk up in value propositions. They talk in um, how many targets do they need to screen for? You know, what's the risk of the targets to fail? How much money do we need to put in? Where is the money sunk? How do you recover your investment? How do you recover your research investment versus how do you recover your late stage investment? Um, the fact that a lot of these interventions fail, right? So you need to invest you know, sometimes at the beginning, but you may not get it back. And how do you then balance? And why do companies eventually uh, decide to invest into some drug? Of course, there's always a commercial drive, right? And when you're trying to develop an intervention that the commercial drive is public health and making it a public good, the business is the government, right? So the business is, the government is the purchaser. And so you need to then figure out how to then change that language so that we can speak like if we were pharmaceutical uh, companies, but we are really serving a different type of population. So we had to learn a lot of um, these uh, kind of activities. And that's where the second system, the second lesson came about, right? It, you know, we think about, oh, you know, I'll just make a hookworm vaccine, I'll design the discovery, I'll kind of make a prototype, but you don't realize 
the complexities, talk about you know, the topic of this uh, you know, uh, series, right? You know, is for you to really achieve equity, all the different dynamics and all the things that are really influencing. So in vaccines, you have, of course, the biological properties, all the way that you present, the accessories, the cost, but you also have the entire social aspects, right? And the supply chain aspect, and you know, the delivery aspects. So you know, in fact, there are you know, now, again, various blueprints that really tells you how to walk through um, these very uh, difficult strategic marketing decisions, for example. And that's how we had to kind of like, again, learn even more about you know, the business aspects of you know, doing this work. And then, not because I put them together, they're less important, but then we had to then create the partnerships. And as anything, working with people is not easy, right? You know, some of us get along nice together, but some of us don't. You know, we have different cultures, we speak different languages, you know, so, we, you know, so they, some of them are slackers, you know, others end up doing all the work, you know, so you have to really work with how do you cultivate, you know, those partnerships. And you have to be um, open and you have to be trustworthy too, right, and accountable. And then always, like anybody, always tries to look for funds. And so we look for ways of doing funding. But then never forget that even if you want to start working on a program today, you should communicate it to society very early. Because what if I want to do all this hookworm vaccine idea and I go all the way where it's ready and then nobody wants to use it? Because they don't, nobody wants, you know, understands it or cares for it. So you really have to do it very early on. And that's that lesson, the third lesson, right? You know, that the space we were working required, you know, an out-of-box funding, you know, um, system. We had to diversify how we get money. We had to think about this IP strategy because we would wanted to make sure that they were incentives um, and that who would gain access to this technology. And as you know, when you are designing something for 90% of the people, but that brings 10% of really the commercial revenue, it's not very easy to sell, right? Um, and they're clearly products that have market failure. And again, these are why they're public goods, right? So you really need to understand that maybe you should not really talk to the Minister of Health. Maybe you should talk to the Minister of Economy because they're the ones who really are, have the power of the money, right? The Minister of Health doesn't usually have much authority in the money, right? And that's what also then reminded us that, you know, when we wanted to do all this work and when you're working in whatever organization you may work, even though meeting the scientists was, of course, the easiest and the first thing you think that you should do, you know, who are you going to collaborate with, we should definitely don't start there. We should start with our general counsel, with our, you know, the leaders, the, those who do the tech transfer, because they're the ones who are going to really help us then enable the work that we do in our labs. So for example, with Baylor, we from you know, the moment we were recruited, we started to you know, get to learn about the licensing group and let them know, right? You know, look, we work on this. This is likely not gonna bring revenue. We need help. How do we design the technology access, the intellectual property strategy? And that's how we ended up doing. And again, intentional dissemination, right? You know, not only locally, but globally with different modes of doing it, right? You know, working with your societies, working with your, of course, governments, working with um, uh, different journals through task forces, working, you know, with different ways, right? And certainly journalists, right? You know, communication should, through journalists. So at the end, we ended up with a framework, right? So it's, it's, to summarize, it's, it's an open science framework where we really want to just you know, tech transfer as much as we can, share everything that we can, that we would create teams and partnerships that were beyond the science, right? More in the entire STEAM disciplines, that we were going to really pay attention to this cultural intelligence of what technologies would be amenable and needed around the different areas of the world, removing as many barriers as we can, making sure that we use this concept of reverse innovation, valuing the science engagement, and of course, figuring out how to get the money, right? So all of this was happening, you know, the first 15 years, as you know, we did uh, develop a, a two candidates for hookworm vaccine. It's actually currently in phase two clinical trials. We actually have 
One candidate for Schisto is also in phase two clinical trials. We are now developing a Chagas vaccine, which is going to start clinical trials in the end of this year. But as you know, the world was changing, right? And the MDGs came and gone. We had some great achievements, but not enough. So the UN decided to expand them, and now we have you know, 17 sustainable development goals. So even more audacious and broader, right? And we knew, right? I mean, that's why we you know we're always, as scientists, we're always also like looking to see where, of course, we follow where the money investments are because when you apply for grants, you have to find where money to apply. But we started like, you know, paying attention what other diseases were out there that would be of our interest. And, you know, certainly the SARS outbreak, you know, started kind of like, you know, bringing some attention to us. Some of our partners actually were working in that area. So they kept us updated of, you know, the whole, you know, what was going on with these um, coronaviruses. Um, and even before we, we, we had the 2012 MERS, we already had moved down here. And, and in fact, on 2010, 2011, we decided to, okay, let's study coronaviruses. This looks like to be very interesting. Seems to also affect, you know, pretty much the low middle income country settings um, with spillover, of course, to the high income countries. We created a partnership. We started focusing on, again, a technology uh, that would be low cost, that we, in case there were to be another outbreak, it could be used. We develop a SARS vaccine, which we could never deploy because then, of course, there was no interest for SARS. The NIH eventually told us, oh, we now have MERS, like start working with MERS. And then, of course, in 2019, you know, we said, okay, what's going on? Another coronavirus. So we were ready, right? So we scientifically, we were ready. Um, we, we had already some partnerships. We had some um, experience also how to bring everybody together. And so we decided that, you know, if this was our chance, right? So we used the same uh, target, which was this receptor binding domain of the uh, SARS-2 um, spike protein. We, what we do is relatively simple, right? We engineer the, the starter kits for you to make a vaccine prototype. We specifically selected a, a vegan technology. It's a, it's a yeast-made technology, uh, which requires um, uh, not a lot of, an, not, no animal-derived products, so, and it's very scalable, it's very reproducible. Uh, we knew many manufacturers already know uh, in the world how to make yeast products. We also, uh, in our labs, um, already can create the process of how they can make the prototype. We use up to 10 liters, which you would think is not too much, because in these industrial factories, they make thousands of liters, 10,000, 20,000, 30,000. But you have to start, right, you know, scaling up the process. We also showed them how they would be able to do all that documentation and the testing for the quality, you know, to ensure, you know, reproducibility. And then our hope was, let's give it away. And the only request we have is, please let us work with you. Because we want to learn how do you go from 10 to 1,000? How do you, re, you know, look at the work that we've done? Can we learn from you as you, of course, gain from the prior knowledge that we had in our labs? And we wanted to, therefore, then share publicly so that, you know, even if you don't want to really work with us, at least you have access to our information. And uh, then we decided that we, you know, we were going to do these tech transfer considerations because we had some comparative advantages. These protein vaccines are well established. They're already safe, suitable for pediatrics also, has prior um, track record with the hepatitis B vaccine. It was something that our commercialization office um, thought it was the easiest path, right, because we wouldn't have that, you know, um, uh, blocks from like, you know, the industry, right? Because they were pretty generic. And we, we um, found four groups that really were very interested in what we did. And let me just um, explain to you who these, who these groups are. First of all, you would think that, you know, multinationals or these pharmaceutical companies, yes, the majority are in the high income countries with big names, right? GSK and Merck and you know, AstraZeneca and whatever. But there are, there, are, there are a group, they're called the Developing Country Vaccine Manufacturing Network that has, have existed for you know, years. And in fact, they are, for the most part, the follow-on producers of the big pharma. 
So if Merck wants to make more of their products, they contract you know, a developing country producer, but the brand is still Merck, right? But the producers are in India, in Asia, in, you know, in Latin America or whatever. So they never really innovate themselves because all their business is receiving from somebody else and then just being you know, kind of like a producer for them, right? So that's what they're called follow-on producers. We show that there's an alternative model where these producers can do uh, from the beginning, so they're first-rate innovators, um, meaning they can receive a 10-liter recipe and they make it into a mature recipe. And that's um, the, four, the four groups that were really interested in this was one in India, Biological E, one in Indonesia, Biopharma. Those are probably the largest of, of, of the list where um, they already had experience. They already knew how to make hepatitis B vaccine. So very quick at you know, capturing the recipes and scaling it. Uh, Incepta is a smaller country, and therefore it's a smaller uh, pharmaceutical company, but they were also pretty knowledgeable. And then I'll tell you what we ended up doing with uh, Botswana, which had no infrastructure, right? No um, capability uh, before, of course, COVID-19. So we ended up three vaccine models, right? So the first scenario was with the big ones, right? Like Indonesia, um, India, and Bangladesh, which they already had experience with hepatitis B. They already had been working with the uh, global regulators. They had many of their vaccines were pre-qualified for even uh, export. Um, they were very established, and they were really aligned with the mission that we wanted to do. And they allowed us to co-develop with them. So we were with them through the process. The scenario two, which was, how do you work with someone who really wants to learn but has nothing, right? So we joined forces with a company called Immunity Bio, which is part of the NANT um, uh, industries. And, and together with India, in fact, we said, OK, you, of course, need to build a factory. You have to. But you also need to build a workforce. And you have to start training the people that will work in that factory. And so we'll give you our technology, because then you can, le you can play around and learn as you're waiting for all the factories to be made. But, and we're, we're building that workforce. Um, and that's you know, the, the, the experience that we're doing with them. We have scientists coming to learn here. We you know, guide them in the way that they should you know, um, develop the infrastructure. And at the same time, they're learning the skills of doing yeast recombinant vaccine. But then, surprisingly, there's, there's another scenario, which is the scenario of people who just read our papers. You know, and in fact, I just came from Cuba yesterday, um, where you know, they, of course, we could not formally send them reagents, right? There are you know, ways that you can collaborate scientifically. Like, you know, I was there, so there are ways. You, know, you go in, you can interact. But for the most part, they could not do the same exercise as we did with India and with, uh, with uh, Indonesia, right? So, but they read our papers because we published everything. And if you focus on what their Abdallah vaccine is, it's almost pitch perfect the same construct that we made that we then ended up giving to India and Indonesia, right? Of course, they put their own little flavor. They did whatever they could do. But ultimately, it was a pretty successful um, uh, approach. And now, what can I say? You know, our impact has been huge, right? You know, just with India and Indonesia, we have reached almost 100 million doses that you know have been used, and you know, uh, vaccinate vaccinations. A little extra regarding biopharma. You know, it's in a Muslim majority country and region, uh, so culturally, they also were very interested in the yeast technology because they could apply for a halal certification. So they, again, going back to our regulatory science, we had all the documents so that they could then show their regulators and their regulators that certify for halal readiness, and they actually did get you know, halal readiness. So I'm going to finish up then by you know, what's brewing now in our labs, right? You know, so most of our technologies use this um, yeast technology. We have others, but for the most part. But for COVID, as you know, if we didn't stop, of course, at just the original COVID. We have a gazillion you know, variants. So we've been transferring variants, a go-go, to them. 
Uh, eventually, it was selected like, you know, everyone, everybody's working now on the bivalent, which is the original Wuhan together with the BA.4.5 Omicron variant. But we continue to do um, more co-formulation, like putting more molecules together. We're actually resurrecting our SARS because they all come, you know, the, the Sarbico families are um, primarily four, four clades, as you can see, you know, yeah, four, 1A, 1B, and 2 and 3. So we're trying to also do what we call potential universal vaccines that maybe we can create a vaccine that may be not 100% perfect, but if we get X coronavirus, we at least can get immunized and get some reduction of the burden, right? So that we can be protected. And then, of course, we do a lot of science, you know, by looking at the structure, the function of these, um, um, you know, targets from the spike protein. But then I want to make sure that now whatever we learn from COVID maybe can help us to also address how to develop these neglected disease vaccines. So we really learned that you need something that, they, that, that low middle income country producers can get incentivized. You know, and either because they're acquiring a new technology or because they can repurpose some existing capacity or because they can increase their efficiency and knowledge, maybe they'll, they'll like to play with our hookworm vaccine so that they can you know, add to their portfolio, right? Um, we clearly know that we uh, suffered a lot by not only the supply chain issues, but also the lack of knowledge, right? You know, you, you have to have a workforce, and a workforce that sustains their uh, training constantly. You cannot train in vaccine development and then, okay, go do something else and come back when we have an emergency. You have to keep them updated, right, you know, with better, better um, training programs. The standardization, right? You know, sometimes that was very hard, right? You know, what reagents we got here is not the same thing they got in India. How can you standardize, right? Um, models, um, of course, quality, regulatory, very difficult, right? You know, the regulators in India, you know, maybe they don't follow the same as what the U.S. does, and that's why the U.S. You know, it's stringent, and you know the others that they're, they're not considered. But in fact, to be very honest, working with the India regulator, sometimes they were even more stringent than the U.S. But they don't get their credit, right? They don't they don't get that ownership of also being um, highlighted as uh, powerful institutions, partnerships again. And of course, we still need to figure out how we're going to pay for all this, right? You know, like we suffered through the COVID. So thank you very much. You know, I hope that this you know, story um, you know, incentivizes you. It requires a lot of curiosity, courage that I think you know, and commitment we all have, uh, community, right? We all need to work together. But we have to really be very cognizant of you know, where and for whom we really are doing what we're doing, right? Which is usually people. Uh, and that's you know, a photo of our, our, our group that has been working in, in the COVID vaccine. And, that neglected disease vaccines. Thank you. Is there time for questions? I, let's see what time we have. Yes. Yes, a very, so the question is, how can we even within our own um, community incentivize legislators and our, and our representatives, right, to support not only local but global um, health issues? Um, and I have to say, you know, you have to really contact them and getting to know them and understand, even at the time of when you elect them, right, that they, that they have a vision for um, serving equitably even within our communities. And Houston is very unique, right, because it's, we are diverse already. We, are, we have representation of the world just here, right? So I think that, that that would incentivize them more because, you know, it's affecting the people locally, but also, of course, you know, um, globally. And so it's just to really raise our voices. 
Um, and, and on that note, I have to say that who also ends up in those positions need to be educated really early on, right? So it all starts from education, even from when you're in school, right? And in, in, certainly in academia, is, you know, we're training people who eventually will take those roles. And so if you give them a good perspective, like, you know, this series and this course is, you know, they can actually think of them uh, when they're actually serving, you know, in those positions. Um, so get involved more, right? And, and, and if you have an opportunity of doing um, briefings with their staffers or um, uh, joining, you know, some one of these think tanks where they, they where they actually invite them to speak to the communities, or when they go and do the town halls, right? You know, to really bring up the raise the voices. I think we sometimes forget, right? Yes. Yes, and, and, I, and I guess my answer is be intentional with that engagement, right? And, and I know we end up, and that's a little bit of, fault of the fault of our own ourselves, right? That you end up talking just to ourselves. We talk to ourselves. You go to scientific conferences. You, of course, you know, mingle around your colleagues that are in the same field. But you don't really go out and talk to the community and really engage more that community. And I think that we have to do better with that. So, if, if, so as you go along and you, of course, have to learn all the skills and the concepts and work in whatever you end up being as a PA, you know, you, of course, are very important because you have direct interaction with the community, right, with the patients that will come. But even go beyond that, right? You know, um, I've been doing, for example, you know, meet some organizations and you go talk to a church, right? You know, so, you know, faith, you know, um, groups are great because they have their congregations and you can go speak, you know, they already are getting together, right? Or high schools or schools, right? Start really early. Um, different, di not only think that just because you are publishing which your papers are going to just be read by those who are interested in your paper. And then, therefore, write also outside of of the scientific realm, right? You know, do more uh, intentional writing for the lay public, right? Or create media or or information that can be used uh, for for anyone to read. And I have to say, um, engaging the media, because remember, they they are the ones who, whether they over dramatize something, they're always looking for a story, right? But but you have to really, you know work with those that they can really show the truth of things and they, that the truth doesn't get distorted, right? So a lot of, certainly the media, what happens is like, you know, just to dramatize something, they, they pick things from here and there and then they make them into something that is really not the case. And very rarely you have the scientists, you know, rebuttaling or at least um, dialoguing it. You know, they always bring all these analysts and scientists are never re there, right? So, you know, you have to, you have to kind of like, get the willpower of doing it. And we don't really get trained for that, right? So usually you shy away, but, um, but it's very important. I want to thank you, Dr. Botox. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. It was a great, thank you. Thank you. great experience. Thank you.